This is uh, showing a pattern that we should be following today, actually, of having men in the church that are, that are preaching and teaching God's Word and that are separated uh, personally, they're separated spiritually, that can go out and preach the gospel in other cities also. Now, the church begets the church, okay? All the way back to Genesis chapter 1, we see that everything brings forth after its own time. And so one church should generate other churches. You know, it started out in the Bible with the church in Jerusalem. And then that church multiplied by sending people out to these different places. Now, in chapter 13 here, we see the church in Antioch. This had become a main hub of the gospel. This had become really a thriving church. Because if you remember back in chapter 11, they went there, they reached a ton of the Gentiles. A whole bunch of people got saved. The church was really growing and thriving with Paul and Barnabas preaching to them. Well, they've got these other guys here, too. They've got now Paul, Barnabas, they've got Simeon that was called Niger, they've got Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean. These are five guys that are, that are doing a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching. And so God says, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them. He's going to pull them out and send them to go preach in other cities. Now, that's what ought to be happening at our church and really every Bible-believing church. Now, first of all, if someone's going to go out and start a church... They should be sent out of a local church. They shouldn't just be totally out of church. And you'll run into people like this. They're not going to church anywhere. Okay? And a lot of times they'll say, well, I can't find a good church in my area. You know, and I understand that, that it can be tough to find a good church in certain areas. But they shouldn't just say, well, I can't find a good church, so I'm just going to start a church and just start pastoring. No, if they're in an area where there's no good church, then they need to get themselves to an area where there is a good church or at least find a church that they can line up with in some way where they can get the training and get the experience of preaching and, and teaching God's Word and then be sent out of that local church, have the, the, the church you know, basically pray for them and send them out. They should go out with that church's blessing, not just say, well, there's no church, so I'm just going to take it upon myself to start one. You know, and I can understand the mentality, but still, biblically, the church should beget the church. And so, really, if someone wants to start a church, then they, they should get in a Bible-believing church that they want to be like. And then have that church teach them and train them, and they can get the experience there, so that they can be sent out to go start a church somewhere else in another city. But you see, the, the key here is that these guys, before they go out and do it somewhere else, notice that they were already found faithful where they were. In chapter 13, verse 1, it says, There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. And he lists these different people. And it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So these are guys that are already prophets, they're already preaching, they're already teaching, they're praying, they're fasting, and they're separated. Okay? He said, separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas. Now, the word separate is an important word, and it's similar to the word sanctify or to make it holy, to set it apart. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. You know, being set apart, being sanctified, being godly. This is what God expects of anyone who's going to preach the word of God. Okay? The Bible says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The first thing that you have to do in order to be a preacher is you have to yourself live by God's word and follow God's word and be separated from this world, different than the world around us, living a godly and sanctified life. But then you also need to be working in your local church, because if you're going to go out and start a church somewhere, you need to be doing the work right here in the church that you're in today. Now, there are so many people today who want to be a missionary in some foreign country, but yet here they are in the United States. The fields are white unto harvest, and you don't see them going out there knocking the doors and, and preaching the gospel. And that tells me that they're not going to do it when they get to that other country either. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not going to do it here. You're not going to do it there. Yeah. Because the location doesn't matter. I mean, you are you. You are saved. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you. You have the Bible, and you're surrounded by unsaved people. Okay, you don't have to raise all this money and go to some other place. Why don't you just do it right where you are and win souls right here? Because you're not a soul winner, that's why. And that's the problem. Not the location, not the geography. And so you need to make sure that you don't always just think about these great things you're going to do for God in the future and say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to do it right now in the church that I'm in right now. You see, 
if you're going to start a church someday, you're going to need to now be able to win people to Christ and get those people to come to church, you know, and, and be able to take someone under your wing and be able to train them and teach them. And there are people in our church right now that you could take under your wing and teach and train things and, and take them soul winning and teach them things out of the Bible. There are a lot of opportunities right where you are, okay? And if you're not going to take those kind of opportunities, you're never going to be able to be used of God greatly in some other place in the future if you're not faithful today. See, long before I ever started a church, I was a church member. And I was out soul winning. I was bringing people to church. I was getting people baptized. I was teaching young people uh, soul winning. I was training others. And so that's what you've got to do. You've got to take the opportunities that God gives you before you just expect to uh, be sent out to this great work that God sent Paul and Barnabas to do. You know, they earned, they earned the right to do that. They basically paid their dues to get to that point. <clears throat> it says in verse 4, so they, being set forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John for their minister. Now, this is John Mark. We're going to see more about him later. But basically, John Mark is their minister. He's their servant. Okay? That's what the word minister means. Just like Jesus said that the Son of Man has not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So this man, John Mark, you know, before he became a great man of God in the future, he needed to learn from somebody else and serve them for a while. That's why John was serving with Paul and Barnabas, who were two of the greatest apostles and, and two great men of God at that time. He was serving them and, and helping them, and a little bit later he failed. You know, he quit, he went home early. And that's why Paul gets really angry. But see, later on, in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, he says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And he went on later to write the gospel according to Mark. So he was somebody who was greatly used by God, but he started out being a servant, being a minister. And that's what he's doing here where we see him with Paul and Barnabas. Well, it says in verse 6, And when they had gone through the isle of the Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. And uh, we'll finish that in a second. Basically, Paul comes to this city and he's preaching the gospel where there's a man in the city who's kind of an important man. He's the deputy of the country, so he's a political leader, Sergius Paulus. And he calls for Barnabas and Saul. He hears that they're in town and they have a reputation of doing a lot of preaching. And so he said, well, I want to hear what they have to say. So he calls them in, but there's a man that's trying to stop this from taking place. He's trying to stop them from hearing the gospel. And that's this man, Elimus, the sorcerer, or Bar-Jesus, depending on which language you look at that in. And basically, Paul just turns this man and very sharply rebukes him and says to him in verse 10, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Keep your finger there. Go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter number 1. So this man was a, a false prophet, the Bible says, and he was also a sorcerer, is what the Bible also called him. And he's trying to stop people from hearing the gospel. He's trying to stop soul winning from going forward in that chapter. Well, look in Galatians, what it says in verse number Six, it says, I marvel, Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But watch this, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So, you see, more often than not, what the devil uses is he doesn't have his own gospel. It's just a totally separate message that he made up his own satanic gospel. No, what he does is he takes the true gospel of Jesus Christ and he perverts it. The word perverted means twisted, okay? Corrupted, twisted, changed. 
And so he basically takes the truth and just twists it and changes it. And then if you take the truth and twist it, obviously it becomes a complete lie. Okay? And so he's saying that there are those that pervert the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So that's a pretty strong word right there. He says that he needs to be accursed if someone's preaching a twisted or perverted or corrupted form of the gospel. Go back to Acts chapter 13. So in Acts chapter 13, we see Paul being very harsh with this guy because he is what the Bible calls a child of the devil. Okay? Now, I've heard a lot of preachers and people say that every person who's not saved is a child of the devil. I don't believe that at all. Okay? Because when you become saved, you become a child of God. And we always make that very clear that once you're a child of God, you're always going to be God's child. You know, it's sort of like my son will always be my son. You know, even if he disobeys me, even if he does everything that I taught him not to do, he's still my son because he was born into my family and that is a, something that will never change, okay? He's my son, I'm his dad. Well, just as when a person becomes a child of God, that's a permanent condition, you know, there are some people who have become a child of the devil, according to the Bible. And the Bible talks about those people in the book of Jude in the context of false prophets, false teachers. Go to, go to Jude, if you would. I'll show you that. <clears throat> and he says that these men have crept in unawares. Now, you're always going to find this consistent throughout the Bible. Look up every time it talks about the children of the devil. Okay, It's always people who are preaching a false, twisted gospel, who are preaching lies, who are trying to deceive people. It's not just your average unsaved person who is deceived. Now, remember the Apostle Paul, he had preached false doctrine in the past. But he said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He wasn't trying to do wrong. He thought he was doing the right thing. He wasn't an evil person just out to twist the gospel or twist the Bible for financial gain or for his own pride or whatever reason. He was just honestly doing what he thought was right, but he was sincerely wrong, okay? But that's why he obtained mercy. But there are others who have purposely crept in, who purposely go about to, to uh, sow seeds of false doctrine and lies and heresy. And these people are the children of the devil, and the Bible is always consistent with that. Look at the book of Jude. The Bible says in Jude, verse number 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now notice, they're taking something that's true, right? And then they're changing it into something else. You see that? They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. So they're taking true Bible doctrine and twisting it into something that it's not. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about in verse 5 that they are unbelievers. And then if you go down a little bit, it, uh, it, it goes, I'm not going to read the whole chapter for sake of time, but he's describing these people over and over again. Look at verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, Without fruit, look at this, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So there are trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Okay. Now, I, we don't have to turn there, but I read it, I believe, on uh, Sunday night, Matthew chapter 13. It talks about the parable of the tares. He said, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. Well, the good seed represents the children of God. The, 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 the wheat that grows up is the children of God. The children of the kingdom are the wheat. And he said, the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, when did the tares appear? What were the tares? Well, the tares appeared, the Bible says, but when the blade sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. At that time, the tares sprung up, and the tares were a counterfeit that looked like the wheat. And the householder tells the servants, don't try to pull up the tares, because he said, I'm afraid you're accidentally going to pull up the wheat, because they look so much alike. So he said, let both grow together until the harvest. The Bible says a few verses later that the tares there are the children of the wicked one. So according to Matthew 13, the children of the wicked one are those who would basically infiltrate and try to look like 
true Christians, try to look like, you know, a Bible preacher, try to look like a real soul winner, but they are an imposter, they're a counterfeit. And that's what the tares are. And they look right, but they don't bring forth any fruit. And notice, when do they show up? When fruit is brought forth. You know, they're going to infiltrate a place that's winning a lot of souls, that's getting a lot of people saved. That's where they're going to want to creep in. And their goal is to hinder the work of God, to hinder soul winning. Now, that's why the Bible has such harsh words for them. Okay. Now, I run into people all the time who don't believe right, who don't believe the truth. And I don't give them harsh words. You know, if I knock on somebody's door and they're not saved and they don't want to hear the God, I just say, hey, have a good day. You know, I mean, it's not their fault. They're blinded. They're deceived. You want to reach those people. You want them to get saved. Hey, they didn't get saved today. Maybe they'll get saved tomorrow. And we run into all kinds of people who are not saved. And we're not rude to them. We're nice to them. We love them. We want them to be saved. But, you know, every once in a while, you'll run into just these total false prophets. Yeah. You know, these kind of people who are just out to destroy everything that's right. Out to destroy everything that is the truth. And you'll run into people where you're trying to give somebody the gospel and they just want to get in there and just stop you from preaching the gospel. And that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 13. Paul is trying to give this guy the gospel. He's really interested. Well, this other guy says, well, I'm going to stop this. And this guy, Elimus, gets in there and just, you know, tries to confuse everything. Is just blowing off his mouth and Paul and everything. And that's why Paul gets so angry. Because this guy is a false prophet, child of the devil, trying to twist the gospel because he said that he perverted the right ways of the Lord. And this guy gets a really harsh rebuke from the mouth of Paul. Look at Titus chapter number 1. Titus chapter number 1. It says in Titus 1, uh, verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Notice, deceivers. Okay? There are many deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. Why? For filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a what? Prophet of their own said, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now when he says rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, I think he's talking about the people that they're subverting would get sound in the faith. It will rebuke these false prophets and false teachers. Because he says these false prophets, he says they're creeping in and they're teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. It's not that they're just mistaken. You see the difference? It's not that they just, well, I didn't learn that yet. I'm a little mixed up. No. They're saying, I'm going to teach false doctrine for the sake of me getting paid. You know, I'm going to make more money. And there are all kinds of preachers all across America today that are preaching false doctrine because of money. Because of filthy lucre. They want to drive a fancy car. They want to have a fancy building. And look, it's not hard to figure out the formula for building a giant, fast-growing church. It's not hard to figure it out. You know, you bring in the NIV. You bring in a rock concert. You don't preach anything controversial. You tell everybody that everything goes and that there's, you know, everything's fine and never talk about hell and don't rip on specific sins. I mean, it's not really that hard to figure out. And you see these churches spring up overnight. Adventure Church. You know, Community Fun Baptist. You know, Fun Center Baptist. And they preach lies. Because they know that that is what is going to attract the biggest crowd of mindless people that will just come and rock out and jam for Jesus with them. And they're doing it for money. That's not somebody who's just misguided. That's not, that's not an accident. And those people are damned, my friend, right. for, for standing up and knowingly preaching lies, okay, because of the fact that they want financial success in this world. Nothing could be more wicked than to twist the message of the Bible for money. That's right. I mean, how corrupt could you be? And that's who, that's who he said needs to be rebuked sharply. And if you look at who Jesus rebuked sharply, he rebuked the Pharisees because they were false teachers. They knew that they were liars. Yeah. And they preached everything because they loved the praise of men. They loved the glory of men. They loved the money and the offerings that they got. He preached the hardest against those kind of people. You know, other sins were definitely condemned. I mean, he definitely condemned adultery. He definitely condemned everything else. 
But the people that he really railed on were the false prophets, the false teachers, the people who were knowingly preaching lies. And so that's why this guy gets chewed out like that in Acts chapter 13. It says in verse 11, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So this guy got cursed with blindness right there by the Apostle Paul. Now it's interesting because this is where he starts being called Paul. And to be honest with you, I have no idea why, but all throughout the book of Acts, he's always called Saul. And then all of a sudden in verse 9 it just says, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, and then from then on it just never calls him Saul again. It just only calls him Paul. So I don't know why sometimes God changes people's names or calls people by a certain name. But for some reason, you know, I mean, it's not really that different. You know, it's just one letter. It goes from Saul to Paul. I'm not really sure why. If you have any idea why, then see me after the service and explain it to me, because I don't know why. But uh, everywhere else in the Bible, from here on out, he's going to be referred to by nothing except for Paul. So that's where the switch takes place. I'm not sure why. But it says in verse number 12, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, you think he'd be astonished at this guy who was struck with blindness, but really the Bible says he was astonished at the doctrine. Yeah. You know, he was astonished at the word that he heard being preached by Paul. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because uh, when Jesus did a bunch of miracles, I remember the same type of thing happened where the, the people came to him and they were marveling at all his miracles and the disciples really marveling at some of the miracles that Jesus had done. And he answered and said to them, let these words sink down into your ears. You know, he put the emphasis on God's word all the time. And, you know, it was an amazing miracle, but what got this guy saved was, was the doctrine. You know, that's what he was astonished at, was the doctrine. But it says in verse number 13, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But this is where John, Mark, basically bails out and heads back to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, it's really obvious from this chapter, but just in case you don't pick it up, this is a different Antioch. This Antioch in Pisidia is different than the other Antioch. Because if you remember, the other Antioch is where they actually came out of. There was already a well-established church there. They'd been there for years. But now they're in a different Antioch in Pisidia, kind of like there's an Antioch in California. I mean, they're all different Antiochs. They're all different. You know, there's a Glendale, Arizona, Glendale, California, Glendale, Illinois. And so this is a different Antioch, just in case you didn't pick that up. And so it says, They went into Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. <coughs> and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. <laughs> then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of our fathers, and uh, I'm sorry, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. Now I'm not going to read all this for sake of time just because we already read it a little bit earlier. But he basically just uh, preaches through a little bit of Old Testament history. He gets to verse number 24. When John had first preached before his coming, talking about Jesus Christ, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel... And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Now, when he says that John preached the baptism of repentance, keep your finger there, go to Acts 19. Acts chapter 19, you're in chapter 13. See, there's a false doctrine today that, that we're always faced with where people try to save and in order to be saved you have to repent of your sins. You know? Now, that phrase is never found in the Bible. And when you ask someone to show you that in the Bible, you know, you'll say to them, hey, show me in the Bible where I have to repent of my sins to be saved. What they'll do is they'll take you to tons of verses that say repent, but conveniently they don't say the words repent of your sins. They just say repent. So... The word repent doesn't mean repent of your sins because there are actually uh, 46 verses in the, I'm sorry, 36 times in the Bible, the verses are talking about God repenting. 
Out of all the mentions, I think 105 verses that mention repentance, 36 of them mention God repenting. Of course, if you're reading the NIV, New King James, ESV, or any other of these modern versions, they completely take out God repenting because they want to prop up this false doctrine. They take out Judas Iscariot repenting. They take out Paul repenting when he decided he was going to write a letter and then change his mind about it. You know, they take that out. And they try to say, well, every time the Bible says repent, it means repent of your sins. Well, that's a lie. And so whenever somebody's trying to show you a scripture on this, make sure it actually says of your sins. And then guess what? It won't be there because there's no such verse. So when the Bible's talking about repentance, it's just talking about some kind of a change. Okay? Now that change could be a change in what you believe. It could be a change of mind. It could be a change of action. It could be all manner of different things. You have to read the context to figure out what is changing. Okay? There are people who are lukewarm in Revelation 3. They needed to change. So what needed to change? The fact that they were lukewarm. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, they're worshiping idols. They needed to change and worship the true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Acts chapter 19 and we can figure out the context of the baptism of repentance. Look at Acts 19.4. It says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So we see that exact statement there, the baptism of repentance that we saw back in Acts 13. And by comparing spiritual with spiritual, we can see what that baptism of repentance was. It says he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should repent of their sins. <laughs> And start living a, a Christian life. No. He says, he preached the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Back to Acts 13. And so, sometimes repentance could be talking about turning from a sin. But, whenever it's talking about salvation, it's always talking about changing what you believe. And if it's not talking about changing what you believe, then it's not talking about salvation. Because the only thing that has to change in order for you to get saved is your faith, your belief. Not your lifestyle. Because if your life had to change in order for you to get saved, that would be salvation by works. You know, if you had to make some change in your actions and change in your lifestyle, that would be salvation by works. But if it's just believing on Christ, well, that's by faith. And so, if a person is not saved, Something has to change. And that something is what they believe. I mean, it's pretty simple to understand. It's not hard to see. If somebody is Islamic, something's going to have to change. You know, they're going to have to believe on Jesus Christ and forsake that false religion. Right. If somebody's a Catholic, you know, they're trusting in their works to save them. That's going to have to change. And they're going to have to change from that and put all their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And by the way, when you're out soul winning, if you knock on a door and you preach unto that person... And when you leave the door, that person still believes the same thing that they believed when you got there. That person didn't get saved. Mm -hmm. Either one of two things is true. Either they were already saved, or they're still not saved. Because in order for a person to get saved, what they believe has to change. Yeah. You know, It's not like, well, I got there and they believed everything right, but I just prayed with them and now they're saved. It's like, well, if they already believed everything right before you got there, they were already saved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they believed wrong when you got there about the gospel, about Jesus Christ. Obviously, a lot of people have wrong beliefs about other things that don't really matter that much. But when it comes to your belief on the Word of God and on Jesus Christ, that's going to have to change in order for them to be saved. So your goal when you're soul winning is to change what people believe. That's what soul winning is. You're going out and you're changing what people believe. Or inviting people to change what they believe by showing them the Word of God and preaching unto them, trying to get them to change what they believe. That's all that soul winning is. And, you know, I'm a strong believer in praying with people and assisting them and calling upon the name of the Lord as their Savior. But they have to change what they believe or else call, they're, they're not calling upon anybody there. I mean, they're just speaking words and it means nothing. The change has to take place in what they believe. Because how then shall they call on Him in whom they've not believed? You know, and if their faith is not in Jesus Christ when they call upon Him, well, then they're just talking into the air and they didn't get saved. You know, and you got a lot of people today who go around just praying with people and basically just quickly show them a couple verses. Okay, let's pray. But what changed about what they believed? That ought to be what we ask ourselves. And if nothing that they believed changed, then they didn't get saved. And so that's what it means 
uh, repentance in regard to salvation. Okay. Now, some people don't have to repent of anything when they get saved because some people don't really believe anything. And you talk to them and you preach them the gospel and they believe it and they get saved. But people who are believing in another gospel or another God, they're going to have to repent of that. You know, they're going to have to change. Some people just don't have any belief. They don't have any God that they worship and they just believe the gospel and they get saved. So you say, do you have to repent to be saved? It depends on the person. Because if you don't believe anything, then you don't have to repent of anything. You know what I mean? You just believe the gospel. Some people say, well, you have to repent of unbelief. Well, okay, that's like saying, well, you have to repent of unbelief and believe. Isn't that a little bit redundant? <laughs> you know, that'd be kind of like, you know, would you please shut the door and don't leave it open? You know, I mean, that, that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense. It's redundant. You know, because a lot of people say, well, you've got to mention repent, you know. Well, then why did the book of John never mention repent? Amen. When the book of John is the only book in the Bible that claims to be written so that someone will get saved. Yep. says, these words are written that you might believe on the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his name. That's the purpose of the book of John, and yet it never mentions the word repent. Because you don't have to mention the word repent when giving the gospel, because guess what? If a person believes on Jesus Christ, that's enough right there. But the problem is that if they believe in some other false god, they can't believe on Christ until they repent of that thing. Okay, So it's enough just to say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I would tell someone that they needed to repent if they believed a false doctrine. That's why usually when you see preachers in the Bible using this, they're using it on a religious crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're always preaching. Where do you see repentance preached the most in the Bible? The book of Acts. Because who are they constantly preaching to? The Jews. Yeah. And all throughout the book of Acts, they're preaching to the Jews saying repent. What about when they're preaching to the Gentiles? You know, you don't really see it. Because you see it focused more at the religious crowd. You see it focused at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's when John really preached repent, is when they showed up. That's when he really started preaching on repentance. Okay? You look at the Philippian jailer, he's just told believe. Believe on Christ. You know, we don't know that he had anything that he really needed to repent of there. He just needed to believe the gospel. He just needed to believe on Christ. And so, don't let people fool you on that. We have hundreds of verses in the Bible that say salvation by faith alone. You know, don't let somebody shake your faith on that and try to add something here. And say, well, before you believe, you have to repent of your sins. Okay, well, that's work salvation, okay? Yeah, that's right. And uh, John, Jonah 3.10 spells that out. Okay, so let's get back to Acts chapter 13 here. Basically, he begins to preach about Jesus Christ. I've got to hurry for sake of time here, and because my throat's giving out. Everybody's sick, of course, so I'm going to just blow through this tonight. Basically, he begins to preach about Jesus Christ, talking about how he died on the cross, and how they basically, look at verse number uh, 29, it says, actually, look at verse 27, this is interesting, it says, For they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So why did they crucify Jesus? Because of the fact that they didn't know God's word, they couldn't hear the voice of the shepherd, they couldn't hear God's voice. It says in verse 30 that after Jesus died on the cross, it says, but God raised him from the dead. So who raised Jesus from the dead? God, God. God, right? Okay. Keep your finger there. Go to John 2. Keep your finger in Acts 13. Here's a great verse for the Jehovah's Witnesses that we're turning to in John chapter 2. Really for two reasons. Because right here it proves not only the deity of Christ, but it also proves the bodily resurrection of Christ, which the Jehovah's Witnesses deny. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't. They'll try to tell you that they do. They'll lie to you and say, oh, we believe Jesus rose from the dead. And you say, oh, he physically rose from the dead? Oh, no, no, just his spirit left his body. Well, James 2.26 says, but as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So according to James, the spirit leaving the body is called death. That's not a resurrection. And they do not believe that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead. And if you actually pin them down and ask them, they'll come right out and tell you that they do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead physically. But look at John chapter 2. This proves that Jesus' resurrection was not a spiritual resurrection. It was a bodily resurrection. It says in verse number 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Now that right there shows that the resurrection was Jesus' body right. raising up. Not a spirit, not a soul. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He spake of the temple of his body. He rose up his body. And not only that, but who rose it up? He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And yet in Acts chapter 13 and in many other scriptures... It says that God mm -hmm. raised up Jesus right. from the dead. The Father raised up Jesus from the dead. And yet Jesus said, hey, I lay down my life willingly. He said, I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. That's right. So Jesus right. said that he rose himself up from the dead, physically, bodily. And so is the Bible right when it says that God raised him up? Yes. Is the Bible right when it says that Jesus Christ himself raised himself from the dead? Yes, because Jesus Christ is God. Amen. You know, and people make a mistake when they try to separate too much between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they try to uh, divide those three up. No, these three are one. And so don't try to divide those three up. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Which is why this statement can be made so many times both ways in the Bible. you got several scriptures that say Jesus raised himself up. you got several that say God raised him up. It's because Jesus is God. But back in uh, Acts chapter 13, it says in verse 32, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, <clears throat> this glad tidings, this phrase is found in Isaiah 61.1. And it's quoted in Luke chapter 4 as the word gospel. Okay, so glad tidings is a term used throughout the Old Testament. Gospel in the New Testament is used synonymously. Glad tidings is like good news. That's basically what gospel means. And so he's saying, hey, the good news is that God has fulfilled his promise by sending Jesus Christ to be the Savior. Okay, and it says he's raised him up again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, don't blow past that. Stop and read that in verse 33. That's an interesting statement. Because what does Jesus rising from the dead have to do with that verse that's quoted right there? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Doesn't that seem a little out of place at first? Like, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee was fulfilled when Jesus was risen from the dead? You say, hmm, how does that work? Well, keep your finger there. Go to Revelation 1. Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> And we can begin to shed a little light on that. Why it says it in that way. It says in Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and watch this, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So in Revelation 1 right there, we see that Jesus is what? The first begotten of the dead. So that's what ties in with Acts chapter 13, when he said, he raised Jesus from the dead, as it is written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So that phrase, it's a very common phrase in the book of Psalms, Hebrews, elsewhere. When he says, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, what day is he talking about? The day that Jesus rose from the dead. That's the day he's referring to according to Acts 13. That's the day he's referring to according to Revelation chapter 1. Now the reason that that's important is because the word beget, it has different meanings in the Bible. It's used in various ways. And I'm not going to get into all the intricacies of that tonight. But it's used in a few different ways throughout the Bible. But I will say this. One of the main uh, meanings is basically to cause something to come into existence. To generate life. Okay? Now, a lot of people will mistakenly think that the Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee would be referring to when uh, Jesus Christ was placed in the womb of Mary, for example. Okay. Well, Jesus Christ existed before that. Okay. Jesus Christ was already in existence before Bethlehem, before, he was, uh, before Mary was with child. Okay. 
Jesus Christ is from everlasting, the Bible says. Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ was God. And so we don't want to think of it as him coming into existence when he was placed in the womb of Mary. Okay. But at the resurrection, he was dead and basically came back to life. Now, the reason that that's important, that that was called a begetting, okay, when Jesus rose from the dead... Because that ties in with our salvation. The Bible says that we have been begotten again. Okay? Begotten again. He's begotten us again unto a lively hope. Begotten again, similar to the term born again. Okay? We have been begotten of God, the Bible says. So, before we're saved, okay, we're dead in trespasses and sins, according to the Bible. The moment that we believe on Jesus Christ, our spirit is resurrected. Our spirit is quickened. And at that point, we become a child of God spiritually because our spirit comes to life. In the same way, and this is compared throughout Scripture, throughout the book of Romans, 2 Corinthians, that what happens to you when you get saved is a picture of what happened when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Just as Jesus Christ rose from the dead... Basically, the moment that you believe on Jesus Christ, your spirit is resurrected from the dead. In the same way that Jesus' spirit was resurrected from the dead. Now, has your body been resurrected? No. And so according to the Bible, our spirit is saved. Our spirit is regenerated. Our spirit has been begotten again. But our flesh is not. We still have the same sinful flesh that we had before we got saved. Go to Romans 8 and we'll close with this for a second time. Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8, and you'll see this played out. It says in Romans chapter 8, in verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. So we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that God has given us the earnest of the Spirit. Now, who's ever bought a house before? Do you remember the, the earnest money? Does that sound familiar? Well, the earnest is like basically money that you're putting down on that offer. It's a down payment, okay? Well, that's what the Bible is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when it says that God has sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Basically, our whole body, soul, and spirit has not been saved or regenerated yet. But we've received the first fruits of the Spirit. Our spirit has been resurrected. Our spirit has been regenerated. But our body is still unsaved. Our flesh is still sinful. Which is why we still commit sin. Because we're in the flesh. If we walk in the spirit, we'll do what's right. If we walk in the flesh, we'll continue to sin. Because our, our flesh has not been uh, redeemed yet. Look what it says here. It says, Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the what? The adoption. And what is the adoption? It says, to wit, the redemption of our body. So, have we been adopted as God's children? Spiritually, yes, already. The moment that you got saved, you became a child of God spiritually. The moment that you believed on Jesus Christ, you received the earnest of the Spirit. You were spiritually quickened, spiritually regenerated. Your spirit was saved, but your flesh was not yet saved. Your flesh is the same unregenerate flesh that it was then. We are still waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So we've already received the adoption of our spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, as it says later in the chapter. But we have not yet received the salvation of our body. That will take place in what's known as the first resurrection, which is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's described uh, all throughout the Bible. That's another sermon of itself. And so... Our spirit is saved. We are children of God. But our flesh, not yet. Not until what's uh, known as the first resurrection or the rapture, as it's commonly called, when we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. That's when our bodies will be actually saved. And our body will be resurrected like Jesus was. That's called an adoption. That's why the Bible says, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. He says, I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. You say, well, wait, I thought we were already his sons and daughters. Yes, you are when you're walking in the Spirit. But when you're in the flesh, 
that's the part of you that is not yet redeemed, that is not a child of God. And so that's why the Bible said all of that, you say, what does that have to do with Acts 13? All of that ties into why it said that it was written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son this day have I begotten thee, about the resurrection of Christ. Because the resurrection of Christ was when he was begotten. Just as our spiritual resurrection is when we're begotten of God and when we're born again. And then at the first resurrection, we'll be begotten physically into the family of God. And then we will be soul, body, and spirit, a brand new creature, and we will never sin again once we get to heaven. But until then, we're going to continue to sin because we have the flesh and we have the spirit. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and vice versa. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your salvation that you've given us, dear God, and for the, the faith that we have in Jesus Christ that has saved us, dear God. Thank you for uh, giving us your word that created that faith, dear God, and just please help us to preach the gospel to every creature as these men in the book of Acts did. Help us to be faithful and, and win souls to Christ. And Father, I pray that our church would someday be able to send out men who are uh, preaching and teaching the word of God that could go to other distant cities and uh, start churches and win souls to Christ in other areas. And in Jesus' name,